The following historic recording by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones dates from the earliest days of tape recording and was actually recorded on paper tape. However, it has been digitally restored and although the quality is not to modern standards, we hope that you will find it to be a great blessing. As with all Dr. Lloyd-Jones sermons, its relevance for these modern times is undiminished. I should like to call your attention this morning to the words which are to be found in Paul's epistle to the Romans in the sixth chapter, and in particular, perhaps, the fourteenth verse. The fourteenth verse in the sixth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. We resume our consideration of a theme since the second Sunday morning of this present year, namely the theme of what we have described as spiritual depression. In other words, we are considering the case of large numbers of people while they're clearly and obviously Christians, are not happy. They can almost be described as miserable Christians. And uh, we are considering this theme, as I have been indicating repeatedly, uh, not merely because it's tragic to think that there should be any Christians in such a condition, but still more because of uh, the failure of such people to witness to the faith and the glory of the faith, especially at a time like this, when the world outside the church is so bankrupt and is looking feverishly and helplessly for comfort and consolation and for light. So we look at it for those reasons. It is actually something quite incongruous. The very terms are a contradiction in and of themselves. Miserable Christian. Depressed Christian. Spiritual depression. The thing is intolerable. And therefore we must deal with it. And we've been doing so by considering uh, the various causes of this condition. It can arise from many different causes. And each one has its appropriate remedy and treatment. It's all found in the scriptures. And that is why Christians must live on the scriptures and by the scriptures. If a man doesn't live in the scriptures, well, he's bound to be depressed. He's bound to fail. He's bound to be miserable. We can't live without it. It's our food. We know nothing apart from it. And as I've been pointing out on many of these Sunday mornings, there is a sense in which it can almost be said that finally, the one great cause of spiritual depression is ignorance of the scriptures. And here again we shall find that illustrated as we come back to a consideration of this great sixth chapter of the Epistle to the Romans. The particular cause of spiritual depression which is dealt with here is that sense of failure and of frustration that often arises in the life of the Christian because of the problem of sin. I'm sure that all ministers and pastors would agree with me when I say that probably nothing brings people to us more frequently than some problem connected somehow or another with failure in the living of the Christian life, some falling into sin, some sin that harasses and bothers and gets this individual down constantly in spite of all efforts and endeavors, the problem of sin, some particular sin or perhaps a number of sins. Now, that is the problem that is really dealt with in this great chapter. The Apostle takes it up, of course, in its context. He is interested primarily in the way that certain people misunderstand the doctrine of grace. And because he has said at the end of the previous chapter, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, some were tempted to say, well, very well, if that is so, let us continue in sin that grace may abound. And he is out to ridicule any such suggestion and to show how it displays a complete failure to understand the very basis of the Christian's position. But in doing that, incidentally, 
he does show us in a most amazing manner the way in which the Christian does have victory over sin. Sanctification in the epistle to the Romans does not start in chapter 8, but in chapter 6. And there's no need to wait until we get on to chapter 8, it's all in chapter 6. And I want to try to show you again this morning how the apostle unfolds to us and shows us this way of true victory, even while we're in this life and in this world. Now, we've already looked at this chapter twice. But I come back to it again because I want, if I may, to gather up what I said on the two previous occasions and to apply it, because the Apostle himself does that very thing. Very well, then, let us put it like this. The key to the understanding of this chapter, as it is indeed the key to the understanding of the entire Christian life, is the doctrine of the union of the Christian with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the key. He's, he's unfolded that in the previous chapter, chapter 5, where his whole argument, you remember, has been this, that by nature, by birth, we are all in Adam. Adam was the head of the human race. He was the federal head and representative, but more than that, the entire human race was in Adam, if you like, in the lines of Adam. So that when Adam fell, we all fell. Now that's the teaching of the scripture. And my dear friends, it's no use distributing the Bible throughout the world if you deny its doctrines. That's what the scripture teaches. That all men are in Adam and that when Adam fell, the whole of mankind fell. And became guilty in him. And inherited all the consequences of his sin and of his fall. So we are all born in sin. With Adam. But, and this is the glory of the gospel, it is equally true to say of all who are Christians and who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that they are in Christ. That the relationship which they bear to him is exactly parallel with the relationship that all mankind by nature bears to Adam. As we were in Christ, in Adam, so are we in Christ. As in Adam all men die, so in Christ shall all men be made alive, and so on. Now that is absolutely fundamental. And you notice the apostle goes on repeating it in this sixth chapter. Know we not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Yes, but we've been baptized into him. We are in him. And what he unfolds in this chapter, you remember, is how... Everything that is true of him is true of us. All that he has done, we have done it because we're in him. Now then, we've uh, dealt with that, I say, on two previous occasions in this way. The first argument was that we have died with Christ. We've been baptized into his death. And when the Lord Jesus Christ was dying on that cross on Calvary, all who believe in him were dying with him. Now, we work that out in detail, because it's absolutely vital. We were crucified with him. We died with him. We were buried with him. We've risen with him. We are seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly places with him and in him. The results of all this we have seen is that we are dead to sin, dead to the law. But not only that, we went on on Easter Sunday morning to point out this other conclusion. That as it is true to say that we died with him, it is equally true to say that we have risen with him. Obviously, if we are in him, everything that he has done, we have done. So we are risen with Christ. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, which means that we are living with him. We no longer belong to the realm of the dead. You remember how he puts it there in the 13th verse. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. We've risen with Christ. And we remembered how the apostle in the third chapter of the epistle to the Colossians puts it in one of the boldest things he ever said in his life when he said, ye are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. That's where you are. 
Now then, that is his great argument so far. In Christ, joined indissolubly, mystically to him, these things are true of us. And we've been emphasizing the facts. That's the whole purpose of this chapter, to state the facts. We have died, we have risen, and so on. But now, if we are truly uh, to be living the Christian life and to be experiencing its blessings and especially to be enjoying its victories, we must apply all this. And the apostle does the application for us. And I want particularly, particularly therefore, to consider the verses in the chapter this morning in which he does the application. The important one, in a sense, is verse 11. Listen. Likewise. Now that's it. Likewise. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. That's the application. And there are other parts of the application also. But let me try to summarize the whole teaching for you under a number of propositions. The first is this. That if we want to live and to enjoy the Christian life, and above all, I say, to live it victoriously, the first thing we have to do is to realize the truth about ourselves in Christ. Now, the way of victory in the Christian life is not primarily uh, just uh, to be praying and to be looking to Christ. The first thing we have to do is to realize the truth about ourselves in Christ. That's the purpose of this, uh, this chapter. And again, I must point out how so much holiness teaching completely ignores this sixth chapter of Romans. It depreciates it. It says, oh, we must hurry on to the 8th chapter where the Holy Spirit is first mentioned. As if there's no victory in chapter 6, but it's all here, my friends. And so you see, our theories can often depreciate Scripture. And we must always test our every theory by the test of Scripture itself. And here is the Apostle's method. Reckon, he says, reckon yourselves likewise, therefore. You notice the inevitability of it all. But what does this term reckon really mean? Well, you can translate it, if you like, like this. It can be read, regard yourselves, therefore. Or in the same way, regard yourselves as those that are dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Jesus Christ. Or, if you prefer another phrase, account yourselves. Account yourselves. That's it. You compute, you account, you regard yourselves in this way. Ah, yes, but the vital question is, what does even that mean? Now, here I must be careful to point out that it does not mean that you just act as if this were true. Now, there are some who have interpreted this verse in that way. They say, of course, you're not really dead unto sin. But you, you, if you want victory, you are to act and live in such a way as if you were dead unto sin. It isn't true, of course, but you act as if it were. And as you go on acting as if it were, it will become true. Now, that's not scripture, that's psychology. That's a coism, isn't it? You are no better, but you say every day and in every way, I am getting better and better. And the theory is that as you say that, you actually will be getting better. You're trying to persuade yourself of something that isn't really true. But it's a good thing to do. It's encouraging, it's stimulating. And as you do that, you'll feel better. It isn't that. That isn't what he's saying. The apostle doesn't tell us here to act as if this were true. His appeal is this, realize that it's true. How different. It is true. I'm not persuading myself about something that isn't true. I am to realize that it is true. I am to grasp it, lay hold upon it. And truly to realize it in my constant thinking as well as in my living. In other words, there is no element of make-belief in this. There is no element even of persuasion about it. It isn't something I have to persuade myself about. I am simply to believe the categorical statements of the scripture. 
that because I am in Christ, I have died with Christ. This old man I once was by nature has gone. He is dead. He is finished with. He is no longer in existence. Well, the apostle has been saying that, isn't he? Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Ah, oh, yes, but they say crucifixion is a very slow process. And it's quite true to say that the old man has been crucified, but he's still there. It's a very, it takes a very long time to die from crucifixion. My friend, be careful what you're saying. If that is true of the old man, it's equally true of Christ, and he's, no, and he's not yet dead. The apostle's statement is this, that everything that has happened to Christ has happened to me. My old man is not undergoing a lingering process of dying. He is dead. He is as dead as Christ is dead in that physical sense. He is gone. The thing has happened. Now, I pointed out on Easter Sunday morning how the apostle is at great pains to emphasize this in verses 9 and 10. Listen. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, which means once and for all. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Isn't this the argument? Christ has finished with death. He's finished with dying. He has died. He's completed the act once and for all. Then verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Can anything be stronger? It isn't a lingering process. It's finished with, as it's finished with in the case of Christ. Likewise, understand, realize, regard yourselves as those who have finished with death. You've ended it all. It's finished in Christ. You yourselves have died with him. Well, now then, that, I say, is the thing that we start with. We are to realize that we died with Christ. We are to regard ourselves as those, therefore, who have risen with him, that Christ is now our life. I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. That's it. That's what he means by reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that, as I understand this teaching, is the key to it all. And if we are not clear about that, well, uh, I say it again at the risk of being misunderstood. If you don't realize that and implement it, all your praying about your sin will probably not help you. And you can go the round of meetings seeking for some experience and you won't get it. You may get a psychological experience. You may feel better in certain respects because there are people who can testify uh, to having had marvelous deliverance from particular things that worried them who are not Christians at all. Psychology can do that. I remember the very dramatic case once of a man who had been a terrible drunkard. He'd signed pledges. He'd listened to appeals from his wife and children. He'd read books on the subject. He'd have given anything as it were to give it up, but he couldn't. But on one occasion he had been guilty of terrible debauchery and had spent a very terrible day and night. And at last he'd gone home and had got to sleep and in the morning he got up and was dressing and happened to look at himself in the mirror and was so horrified and shocked at what he saw that it came with such psychological power to him that he literally never drank again. Now that sort of thing can happen. So let us be careful as we preach experiences rather than the teaching of the scripture. You don't found your doctrine on experiences. It's the doctrine that should lead to the experience. Very well, I say, this is basic and fundamental. What the apostle tells a man who's being troubled and harassed by sin is not just simply to surrender it and to wait for victory. He says, reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. And you've got to do it. Nobody can do this reckoning for you. It isn't a state of passivity. You and I have literally got to do this to ourselves and with ourselves constantly day by day. It's the apostles' teaching. It's the inspired word of God. 
So that I say the first step is to realize this great teaching about the union of the believer with Christ and to work out its implications. It's absolutely central and vital. But let me come on to the second point. The second thing in the light of all that, obviously, is to be clear in our minds as to where sin comes in, therefore. If that is the position of the Christian, that he's dead, the old man is finished with, and he is now alive with Christ who is his life, well, where does sin come into such a life? Well, the answer is this. Sin comes in, in what the apostle calls our mortal body. In the sixth verse, he puts it like this, knowing that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. It hasn't yet been destroyed. The old man has died in order that this body of sin might be destroyed. And then, you see, you get it again in the twelfth verse, in the appeal. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. He doesn't say, let not sin reign in you. He says, let not sin reign in your mortal body. That's where sin is. The body still is not redeemed. That is why the apostle, you remember, in the 23rd verse of the 8th chapter, puts this. He says that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting. Waiting for what? Waiting for the adoption. What's that? To wit? The redemption of our body. Sin is still here in the organization of our body, our mortal body, our flesh. The old man is gone. Yes, but sin is still here in my body, in my physical being, which includes, remember, my mind and my understanding as well as my physical processes, my instincts and all these things. Sin is still there. In this mortal body. And do you remember how the apostle had put that so clearly in the seventh chapter also? Here it is again. Now then he says, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And he repeats it. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. This sin in the mortal body. That it seems to me again is another most important principle to grasp. Because, you see, again, we can so easily go astray at that point. There are some who claim a kind of perfection. They say that sin has been taken right out of them altogether. They've got a clean heart. There's no sin in them at all. They've been entirely cleansed from sin. Clearly, the Apostle Paul didn't believe that. He didn't claim that. He didn't teach that. For the good reason, as I shall show you later on, that he exhorts Christians uh, to mortify, therefore, uh, if ye uh, live after the flesh, ye shall die, but if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body. And in the first of Corinthians, the ninth chapter, he again tells us that he has to keep under his body. Sin is there. So that the teaching is not that we are entirely delivered and emancipated from sin in this life. Not at all. I, in a spiritual sense, am. But sin remains in my mortal body, in my flesh. But what a vital distinction it is to know that I, myself, am free. The old man is gone. But sin just remains in that way. Isn't it like this? Isn't it like the children of Israel? You remember they were taken out of the bondage and the servitude in the captivity of Egypt. They were no longer in Egypt, they were in Canaan, yes, but they'd got problems in Canaan. The nations were left in Canaan and they were worrying them as uh, uh, pricks and in their eyes and thorns in their sides. They were no longer in bondage in Egypt, they are in Canaan. Yes, but they've got this fight to wage even in Canaan. It's something like that. There is a residue, a remnant that remains. On the other hand, let us be careful to understand this, that the Christian is not one who goes through this life mourning and defeated and grumbling. Now, there have been Christian people who put it like that, in opposing the perfectionists and those who talk about an entirely cleansed heart, they have rather given the impression that the Christian in this life and in this world 
has a very weary, defeated life, and that he's always going down and is always defeated, they misinterpret the seventh of Romans. I mustn't go after that this morning. But I say the distinction is this. That sin is in my mortal body. Not in me as such. I mean by me the spiritual man. Well, very well, if that's the second proposition, this leads me to the third. And this is the most glorious of all. We have to realize the certainty of our victory over sin. Now then, that's the 14th verse. Listen to it again. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now that is, again, a categorical and an absolute statement. And yet, you know, people are afraid of it. I was reading a commentator on this only this last week, and he, having gone almost entirely with me so far as I've spoken hitherto, suddenly becomes frightened at this point. He puts it like this. He says, this means this. That as we put into practice verses 12 and 13, which tell us, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that he should obey it. Neither yield your members as instruments unto sin, but yield them unto God and your, instruments, uh, and, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. He says, as you do that, sin shall not have dominion over you. For which, if I'd been talking to him, I would have said, thank you very much. And thank you for nothing. It's simply tautology. So if it means that, it simply means this. That as I refrain from sin, sin shall not have dominion over me. But what comfort is there in that? Yet the apostle wrote these words in order to give us the greatest comfort that we can ever have. He doesn't say that as you and I do certain things that sin shall not have dominion. He says, for. It's introduced by for, which means this. Not that it's a a result of something that has gone before. It is the reason for the thing that has gone before. And therefore I say it is a categorical and a positive statement. It is an assertion. And what he tells us is this. That you and I as Christians are not engaged in a hopeless fight against sin. We are assured of victory at the very beginning. Sin shall not have dominion over you. It's an assertion. It's a proclamation. Our victory as Christians over sin is absolutely certain. It's absolutely vital. Now listen to it. We're saying it in that first hymn in a verse which says this. Praise the Lord for he is glorious. Never shall his promise fail. God hath made his saints victorious. Sin and death shall not prevail. Now that's something to be certain of. And the Christian, according to the apostle here, should now in the present be absolutely certain of his victory over sin and his victory therefore over death. They shall not, they'll not be allowed to prevail. Well, now then, why is this so? Why is this victory of ours certain? Why is it that we can say and should say that sin shall not have dominion over us? Well, he gives us the reason. For, ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now, what does he mean by this? Well, let us work it out. Sin shall not have dominion over the Christian because he is not under law. What does that mean? Well, it means this, that while we are under law, we are under the power and under the dominion of sin. Why is that? Well, the apostle answers that question in the great 15th chapter of the first epistle to the Corinthians. Where he says that the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The law is the strength of sin. So that while we are under the law, we are under the strength and the power and the domination of sin. How does that come about? Well, it is the function of the law 
to define sin, to search it out and to convict us of it. And that is why the, sin, the law is always something which is under, into condemnation. It discovers us and it exposes us. It unmasks us. It holds us forth in the court and it brings its accusations against us. We are under its dominion in that sense. But another way in which it is true is this. That while I am under the law, I am left to my own strength only. The law examines me, it condemns me, it defines sin, it tells me what I ought to be and what I ought to do, but it doesn't help me to do it. So that's why the apostle in the 8th chapter, you see in the 3rd verse says, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, weak through your flesh and mine. It says, there's the task, go on and do it. But I can't do it, I haven't the strength, I haven't the power, I haven't the vigor. So the more the law comes to me and indicates what I ought to be, the more, as it were, it puts me under the dominion and under the power of sin. But indeed, the apostle goes further than that. He says this, that, law, that the law, because of sin in me, actually stimulates sin within me. He puts it like this. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law sin was dead, but for I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. But the trouble, as he goes on to say, is in myself. Sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment, might become exceeding sinful. Now, the essence of that is this. Because we are sinful, because of our fallen nature with Adam, which we've inherited from him, the very law that comes to us and tells us not to do certain things and to do others has the effect of encouraging us to do wrong. Well, how? Well, like this. Sometimes by telling children and young people not to do certain things, you're introducing them to those very things. Oh, yes, in your moral teaching, you're telling them about the horrors of these things, the terrible results which they lead to. Yes, but concupiscence is within desire and lust, and it takes hold of this. It says, this is interesting. Ah, that must be pleasurable. Why do men do it? And they begin to think about it and to gloat about it, and they end by doing it. If you hadn't told them not to do it, they wouldn't have heard of it, and they'd never have done it. That's what he's saying. And isn't it true? Self against temptation, be very careful, my friend. I suggest to you that as you read that book, you'll find your very lusts and passions stimulated. With your mind, you'll be trying to say, I want to avoid this, but something else within you will be gloating over it, and you'll like all the details. Or oh, as I've often said again from this pulpit, that's why people delight in reading all these details about divorce cases and murders and things like that, isn't it? There's something in it that appeals to us. So that the very law of God, which is good and holy, which condemns sin, has the effect of inciting us unto sin. So that as long as we are only under the law, sin will have dominion over us. Unto the pure, all things are pure, yes, but we are not pure. And therefore the things that are pure become defiled to us, we twist them, we pervert them. And therefore it is important to realize that while we are under law, we are always under the dominion and the control of sin. Law does not deliver. It was never meant to deliver. And moral teaching will never solve the moral problem. It can't do it, because man's nature is wrong. In that condition, therefore, there is no freedom from the tyranny and the power of sin which we have inherited from Adam. Therefore, he says, 
Sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? Because you are no longer under law. But let's put it positively. We shall not be under the dominion of sin because we are under grace. What do you mean by that? Well, it means this, doesn't it? We are in an entirely different position. And we are in an entirely different condition. The Christian is no longer vainly trying to make himself a better man by applying law and by trying to conform to the law. He's finished with that. He's not under law. He's under grace. What's that mean? Well, it means he's rejoicing in God's free favor. He has heard and he has believed the gospel which tells him that in spite of his failure and his sin, God has forgiven him. That God sent his son into the world, made him of a, a, a woman and under the law, that he might redeem them that are under the law. He has heard and believed the marvelous proclamation that his guilt has been expiated, that Christ has died for it and borne its penalty and that God has forgiven it. Not only that, that God has given him the righteousness of Christ. Indeed, that he's in Christ. So his whole attitude is different. He's no longer trying to make himself something. He's been made something. He has received it as a gift from God. He's been given it freely, without doing anything at all. In his sins, God justifies the ungodly. So he's dead to the law, finished with the law. But he's risen with Christ. He's got a new nature. He's got new desires. The law of God is no longer outside him. It's written in his mind and imprinted in his heart. He wants to do it. It's no longer against the grain. It's no longer grievous. It's the very thing he desires. He loves it. He wants it. Yes, but even more than that, he's a child of God. God has adopted him into his family. He's been given, this, he's become a partaker of this divine nature. Indeed, we can go further, we can say this, and this is the way I think the Apostle really meant it chiefly. Because all that I've just been saying is true of him, he knows that he is one whom God himself is bringing unto glory. Now, that's not my statement. You'll find that put in those very words in the second chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews. In a most remarkable statement in the 10th verse, listen. For it became him from whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. That's the teaching. And it's the teaching here. God is bringing his sons unto glory. He's chosen us. He's elected us. He set us apart. He sanctified us by the Spirit, put us there in that position for himself. And what's he doing? He is bringing us unto glory. I know of nothing more comforting and consoling than that. And that is why sin shall not have dominion over us. Because God is bringing us unto glory. He has put his spirit into us and the spirit is working within us. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God that worketh in you. This is being under grace, you see. The new principle, the new power, the working of God. Not only that I can say this, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. If you are a child of God, God has started a work in you and he's going on with it until you're ultimately in glory. Sin shall not have dominion over you because you're in God's purpose and because his purpose is to bring you to glory. Do you know it means this? Because you're God's child and because it is his purpose to bring you to glory, if you don't respond to his gospel and its appeal, he'll chastise you. That's the argument again of 12th of, of, of Hebrews, isn't it? The Lord chasteneth whom he loveth. He scourgeth every son whom he's called. And if you and I are Christians and we're not obeying God and the leading of the Spirit, don't be surprised if God chastises you. 
You may lose your money. You may lose your business. You may fail in your profession. You may lose your health. Your wife may lose it. Your children may be taken from you. My friend, if you're in the hands of God, be careful. He will bring you to perfection. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Even if it means chastisement. I go even a step further. We are going to be meeting in a few moments at the communion table. And when we meet there, we read together what Paul said to the Corinthians in the first epistle and in the 11th chapter. And you remember it? Let me read it to you, lest some of you may not stay for the communion. Let a man, he says, examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh judgment, damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, which means many are dead. For this cause, because they didn't examine themselves. They didn't realize what they were doing when they came there. They didn't realize their relationship to God in Christ. And because of that, many of them were weak, and some of them were ill and sick and laid aside, and some had even died. That doesn't mean they were lost, no. But it means that God, because they were his children, was chastising them. Sin shall not have dominion over you. It's as certain as that. And in other words, we must emphasize this note of absolute certainty and assurance which is in the word. The apostle is simply saying here, I say categorically, that because we are joined to Christ, we are certainly inevitably going to be delivered entirely from sin. And that is why we should wait for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Now that is the way in which we fight the problem and the battle of sin. It should fill us with joy and with assurance and with absolute certainty. And the joy of the Lord is ever our strength. Very well to conclude. In the light of all this, there is this final exhortation. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Argue it out. Refuse it. Secondly, yield not your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Positively, yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And in turn, mortify through the Spirit the deeds of the body. Mortify your members which are on the earth. In other words, realizing the position, realizing especially this truth that God is bringing you unto glory and that the victory over sin is absolutely certain and assured that nothing can prevent it and nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, don't yield to sin. Don't let it rule even in your mortal body. Mortify your body and the deeds of the body. Mortify the members of your body that are still on earth. But yield yourselves and every member of your body, every faculty and interest that you possess, entirely unto God and unto righteousness. And so, you will actually experience increasing victory over sin in every form and in every guise, even while you are in this life and in this world. That's the position. And I say as I close, that this is true victory, based upon the truth and upon the doctrine, that I am in Christ, 
dead with him, risen with him. Yes, them he hath called, he hath also justified, and whom he hath justified, them he hath also glorified. And realizing this, I face sin in a new way. I say, it shall not have dominion. And I mustn't allow it, therefore. I won't allow it to reign in my mortal body. It doesn't belong to me. It's another realm. I am dead to that. And therefore, I must not yield to it or make any concession to it. And as I say that, and as I act in that way, I know that the Spirit of God is the whole time working in me, both to will and to do that very thing. And so, my victory is assured. I'm no longer despondent. It's no longer a hopeless struggle. I know that I am in Christ and that eventually my body even shall be delivered and that I shall be complete and entire without spot or blemish or fault or wrinkle or any such thing. Complete, perfect, in Christ, in the presence of God. Amen.